Hi, and welcome to the Camp Museum of Art's opening reception for our most recent exhibits. I'm Christy Davis, Curator of Exhibitions. And I'm Kaylee Pisani Page, Curator of Collections and Registrar. You'll notice we're handling our opening and reception a little bit differently this time around from yes. what we did um, in the spring. Mm -hmm. But tonight we have to show you our exhibits retooled highlights from the Heckinger Collection, Approaching the Shift, drawings by Judith Brandon. We also have stories, BIPOC artists from the CMA Collection, and Industry, Invention, and Progress, an exhibit of pieces from our permanent collection, which also includes loans from Hoover Historical Center and the Kinley Presidential Library and Museum. As always, we want to thank our sponsors, Arts and Stark, and all of our other great sponsors who help us make everything that we do here possible. Yes, thank you. So sit back and relax, and I hope you enjoy the opening. Yeah, grab some snacks and uh, join us on our journey tonight. <laughs> In the 1980s, John Heckinger's booming chain of hardware stores led him to purchase a new company headquarters. He found the offices to be efficient but sterile. The barren space sparked an initiative to beautify the headquarters, which launched Heckinger's acquisition of a tool-inspired collection of diverse 20th century art. John Heckinger was dedicated to the art that was accessible and engaging to all audiences. This exhibition furthers his mission by showcasing the diverse range of ideals, materials, forms, and creativity that compromise modern art. To capture this range, 43 imaginative paintings, sculptures, works on paper, and photographs comprise Retooled, which consists of four sections that frame the major themes in this collection. Objects of beauty, material illusions, instruments of satire, and tools in extension of self. The concept of tools in extension of self is well illustrated in Red Groom's I Nailed Wooden Suns to Wooden Skies from 1972. By imagining a world manufactured out of wood and nails, I Nailed Wooden Suns to Wooden Skies illustrates how tools can realize fantastical visions. An innovative painter, printmaker, filmmaker, and pioneer of happenings, Grooms uses fantasy, wit, and satire as ways to comment on modern life in America, especially the city and its inhabitants. In the 1960s and early 1970s, Grooms developed an exaggerated, cartoon-like style which was heightened with the use of bright, high-key colors and bold compositions of everyday subjects. Today, he continues to explore themes related to popular culture, striking an edgy balance between documentation and acerbic commentary. While some work, artists play. The artists in this section repurpose, reframe, and redefine tools with a tongue-in-cheek tone by injecting a dose of irreverent humor into an otherwise work-driven world. These works remind us of the joy and sense of play intrinsic to creation. This sense of play can be seen in Armand's Blue, Red, and Brown from 1988. Armand toys with the expectations of art in the work of Red, Blue, Brown, playfully placing brushes, a behind-the-scenes object, at the core of his work. Born in Nice, France in 1928, Armand Fernandez gave up his surname in youthful emulation of Vincent van Gogh and in 1957 became Armand when a typesetter dropped the D from his name. Around 1960, he began creating his widely renowned accumulations, the artist's term for a construction where he composes multiples of a commonplace item such as pliers or wrenches into broad all-over patterns. As a founding member of New Realism, Armand remains one of the most innovative and provocative artists of our time. Material Illusions In this section, artists modify and distort everyday tools to question their functionality. By reimagining a tool in a material that renders it useless, the artist questions how we interact with that object. 
Transforming a tool into art also highlights how our increasingly pristine and digital lives are detached from the calloused, tool-wielding hands that laid the foundation of modern society. A good example of material illusions can be seen in Hans Godot Frabel's piece Hammer and Nails from 1980. Frozen in mid-swing, Hammer and Nails represents objects in glass, stripping the tool of its intended function. Frabel obliterates the penetrating ability of the nail and the weight of the hammer, while he injects a glint of humor in imagining the shattering results of wielding a glass hammer. He also poses thoughtful questions that address how irrelevant tools are in our increasingly sanitized and sedentary lives. Hans Godot Frabel, born in Jena, East Germany, in 1941, is recognized as one of the world's leading glass artists. His delicate and innovative sculptural compositions begin with heated borosilicate glass rods that are shaped with a hot lamp or by hand. Objects of Beauty Heckinger's quest to amass a preeminent art collection unifying the unprecedented theme of tools rested on a notion that everyday instruments could be objects of beauty. In portraying these objects with a tone of reverence, the artists divorce object from function, yielding works that meditate on tools distilled purity of design. This can be seen in Jim Dine's Toolbox from 1966. The Toolbox series, the first component of what would become the Heckinger Collection, demonstrates Dine's infatuation with these utilitarian objects as he sets tools in restrained yet wildly dynamic compositions. Dine developed an early love of tools at his family's hardware store, and they have remained a favorite subject of his throughout his career. Dine renders these mundane, iconic subjects with the heightened sense of drama created by sensual, gestural surfaces. Judith Maureen Brandon was born in Indianapolis, Indiana in 1963. Brandon's career started in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, where she received her first of many awards from grade school through high school. Judith still refers to the skills she learned as a very young artist in Chagrin Falls. Everyone seemed to have creative skill. I was taught to draw, whittle, make go-karts, model planes, little tin soldiers, and ride horses, all from my neighbors. The dogs ran loose and all had a whistle they were called home to, and us kids were much the same. Judith Brandon attended the Cleveland Institute of Art, where she earned her BFA in enameling and drawing. She has earned accolades across the country for her large, dynamic drawings, as well as two Ohio Arts Council grants. She was included three times in the highly competitive National Weather Biennale International Juried Exhibition. Brandon's work is on multiple book covers and publications, including Leo Theibold's 2019 book, Bay Windows, which features her piece Swell on the cover. Astral energies. Well, there are some places on the planet that have a really special power, and it can be the sheer beauty of nature, or sacred structures, or your grandmother's kitchen. It's all about our connection to the big picture. And I had an experience when I was in Sedona, Arizona, in multiple experiences, when you could feel a swirling energy just coming down from the sky. There's all kinds of clarity and beauty. It just seemed very different from what I'm used to here in Cleveland. And I understood that there are moments when the planet and our connection to it are stronger and reveal a kind of uh, sacred, if you will, energy and power. It feels awkward to talk about, but that's what this piece is about. Is uh, I'm much better at visual communication. So the spiral energies and vortexes, if you looked up vortexes in the encyclopedia, uh, Sedona, Arizona would probably come up. And it has a lot of uh, 
crazy energy and crazy people. But when I was drawing this piece, a lot of things started just coming through into the clouds. So you'll see a lot of creatures and faces and I, I don't know where they came from. They're just in there. Uh, it's all about uh, beauty, beauty and clarity. Uh, who doesn't want that? On the next wall, you'll see a big green piece called Eternal Management Program. That piece is about rhinos. Uh, if you don't know me, I have a thing for rhinos. I make rhino mobiles. I support rhino organizations. They're such a rare and beautiful creature. And at one point, there were many more species of them. But we lost, in the last decade, uh, several subspecies, including the western black rhino, Vietnamese Javan rhino, Malaysian Sumatran rhino, and now there are only two white female northern white rhinos. Um, when a species goes extinct, especially rhinos for me, I feel a profound grief, and the only way for me to express myself really is to make art. So. I wanted to make a piece for the rhinos. And there's a lot of rhinos in that piece. They're subtly drawn in, in the clouds and they're etched in, um, scribed in with a compass. Um, yes, yeah, so if all rhinos are in management programs, uh, so they won't be poached or they're in zoos, hopefully when they go extinct, they don't need an eternal management program, but they can just be free. But for now, uh, on my little piece of paper, it's the eternal management program. So, yep, love those rhinos. The final piece is the realm of all possibilities. This piece started with the geometric pattern of the flower of life, which I scribed in with large compass and rulers and had to walk around the piece as it was laying flat on the ground just to get the uh, geometry right. Um, what's important about that symbol is because it comes from sacred geometry, which believes that all life is part of a divine geometric plan. And I think most of us can see that if you really look at an object. You can see how it unfolds in a geometric pattern, much like our DNA and uh, the cosmos. Um, so I like all of those connections. I like the connections between uh, the divine and geometry and music, and they often come through in my pieces. And this particular image is about the heart, and uh, there's a loosely drawn heart underneath that big black cloud of rabbits jumping, and there's a tiny little city underneath that needs a little uh, TLC. So that was my intention, was thinking about all of the people at this time that just need a little extra care, and how we need to take a little extra care for ourselves. So, in the realm of all possibilities, which is something that one of my friends uh, uses as her statement for life, uh, everything, is, everything is possible. So, I'd like to end with that, and I hope you guys enjoyed the show, and go visit it in person. It's much better in person. Okay. Bye. This exhibit, titled Stories, BIPOC Artists from the CMA Collection, explores the stories and artwork of black and indigenous artists in our collection. Cleveland artist Darius Stewart created this watercolor, titled Back and Forth, in 2015. Stewart's son, Darius Jr., is depicted in the foreground on the swing, while his daughter Emily stands at the back right. 
back and forth is a metaphor for the frustrations that Stuart has encountered in life. The swing moves back and forth in an exciting way, making you think that you are getting somewhere, but then the swing stops and you're stuck back where you started. Stuart uses his children in his work as representations of a bigger conversation on race, as well as a parallel and exploration of his own childhood. This lithograph by artist Elizabeth Catlett is titled Mother and Child and was created in 1945. One of the most influential black artists of the last century, Catlett's work explores the intersection of life and art, confronting race and ethnicity, feminism, and motherhood with her unique fusion of modern art and folk art. Catlett was barred from studying at the Carnegie Institute of Technology because of her race, and instead studied at Howard University and the University of Iowa. During the post-World War II anti-communist movement, Catlett was investigated for her vocal artistic opposition to racism, sexism, and economic inequality. She moved to Mexico in 1946 and was exiled by America after renouncing her citizenship in 1962. This clay piece, titled Zia Pueblo Ola, or Storage Jar, was made in the 1980s by Native American artist Sofia Pino Medina. Medina's work reflects the traditions and crafts of the Zia people, and pottery has always been a means for spiritual expression. Every step of pottery making at Zia Pueblo is performed with thanksgiving and reverence to the spirits of nature. The bird on this pot is unique to the Zia Pueblo and is known as a Zia bird, possibly inspired by roadrunners and chickens. Medina's work was made with red clay and basaltic rock from the Zia Pueblo, painted with natural materials, and fired in an outdoor kiln. Industry, Invention, and Progress Production, Mass Production, Product These words come to us from the ability to make things faster and cheaper. During the last century, symbols of industry such as factories, smokestacks, towers, cranes, and trains became icons of the landscape. As innovations in mass production filled urban factories, the artist's practice was also radically and permanently changed by simple inventions. In 1841, the invention of the metallic paint tube allowed paints to be produced on an industrial scale and easily stored for the first time. Before the 19th century, artists were most often commissioned to make artwork for wealthy patrons or institutions like the church. The machine age brought new clients and creators to the art market. Factory owners could easily afford to buy artworks depicting themselves and their creations. Furthermore, the gains achieved by unions in securing shorter hours and better pay created a new middle class with disposable income and leisure time. These newly affluent families and individuals began buying works of art which were previously accessible for only the most elite members of society. Furthermore, the creation of railroads, steamships, airplanes, telegraphs, and telephones brought distant places within reach of artists and travelers, creating a newfound fascination with faraway locations. This piece from 1921 by Garrett Albertus Benneker is called A Portrait of Homer White. Garrett Benneker's interest in art was expressed at an early age and seems to have been encouraged by his father, Bartel Benneker, who had given up hopes of an artistic career of his own. In 1919, Benneker worked for the Hydraulic Pressed Steel Company in Cleveland, Ohio for a two-year term as artist-in-residence. He worked in a studio right beside the tall chimney of the powerhouse and was given free will to paint and write as he saw fit. He completed around 70 portraits of the company's employees, which were distributed to the workers, and the commission garnered increased demand for Benneker's industrial portraits and industrial scenes. This piece from 2012 by Amy Casey is called Town Assembly. Cleveland artist and graduate of the Cleveland Institute of Art, Amy Casey has exhibited her work regionally and nationally with solo shows in Cleveland, Chicago, New York City, San Francisco, Provincetown, and Los Angeles. Casey has been awarded two Ohio Arts Council Individual Excellence Awards, the Cleveland Art Prize as an Emerging Artist, 
and a grant through CPAC's Creative Workforce Fellowship Program. Amy Casey says cities are fascinating creatures. My neighborhood has definitely infiltrated my work, and you can see bits of it in my paintings. Most all the buildings I paint are real buildings, though sometimes altered, and many of them are from Cleveland since I live here. The work and organization that goes into a city's creation and evolution, the constant shifting and adaptations of layers of changes, I'm curious about the resilience of life and our ability to keep going in the face of ever-shifting circumstances. Casey's pieces ask us to think about the costs of progress and industrial growth. This is Mark Holland, archivist at the McKinley Presidential Library Museum. Last December, Kaylee Pisani Page contacted our collections manager, Kate Bergert, to see if we had anything in our collection the Canton Museum of Art could borrow for their upcoming exhibit titled Industry, Invention, and Progress. Kate suggested to me that we had four etchings of early steel production at the Timken Company. The etchings are beautiful and even somewhat haunting in that they tell a story of a different time when industry was much more dangerous to the common worker. When one of our library volunteers here at the museum, Tom Grove, saw these etchings, he thought he knew exactly who had previously owned them and a little bit about what each of them were telling us about the production of steel. When I was asked to give a little background on each of these etchings, I contacted Richard Stahl, who worked at the Timken Company, and he, along with Tom Grove, who also worked at Timken, sat down with me and we talked steel. Each of these four etchings show a different part of the process of making steel in the early 20th century. The first etching shows a reheat furnace that would be located in a piercing mill. The man in the back left is loading billets onto a turntable made of bricks in the furnace. A billet is a piece of steel that is typically three or four feet long and placed in a reheat furnace to be heated to the temperature of 1,000 to 1,200 degrees. The man in the center of the etching is feeding the heated billets into a shaft and it is molded into what will eventually become a tube of steel 20 feet long using a mandrel to hollow out the middle of the steel creating a seamless steel tube. The Timken Company was noted for its seamless tubing products. It is these tubes that are then cut to size to make bearings for machinery. The second etching depicts where ingots are kept in soaking pits to keep them at a constant temperature until the steel is solidified to be molded or shaped. An ingot is the first step in steel making where a relatively pure piece of metal is cast into a particular shape. This etching shows a crane loading the steel into the soaking pits and a train called a mule delivering more steel for production. The next etching shows a part of a rolling mill where a billet is put under pressure and it makes several passes back and forth over rolling bars until the billet is reduced to a bar of steel. This is a process that was used in the early 1900s. Finally, our last etching shows the time just before the pouring of a heat. A heat is the production of a single melting operation in a furnace, starting with the charging of raw materials and ending with the tapping of molten metal and consequently identical in its characteristics. The molten metal comes from a ladle after it is tapped and the liquid metal is poured into ingot molds. The line of cylindrical objects trailing off from the observer in the middle of the image are ingot molds and the man in the foreground on the right is holding what might be a cap for an ingot mold. The crane operator can be seen toward the top left. He is ready to move the ladle into position and a train engine coming into the mill may be ready to pick up the ingot molds. These wonderful etchings are windows into our past and show how people produced steel for the production of roller bearings at one time in Canton, Ohio. Today, the production of these bearings is much different. 
Originally known as the Electric Suction Sweeper Company, the Hoover Company began manufacturing vacuums in 1908 here in North Canton, Ohio. Prior to vacuums, the Hoover family ran a successful tanning and leather goods business. While Hoover is best known for their vacuum production, they also manufactured other houseware products throughout their 100-year history. Among these was the Buffant Bonnet compact hair dryer seen here made in the 1960s. In the middle display is a toy-sized washing machine, most likely used for demonstrating a ring washer. While some Hoover washing machines were produced here in North Canton, the product was a much better seller in Europe. We just recently found a fun collection of photos showing people from all over the world hauling their Hoover washing machines home, on sleds pulled by reindeer, on a gondola in Italy, even a man walking up the Swiss Alps carrying one on his back. Perhaps the most popular and unique vacuum that Hoover ever produced was the Constellation, first made in 1955. Hoover engineers developed a special technology that allowed the canister to quite literally float on air. When turned on, the device can move around on its own, allowing the operator to move more freely around the room with the hose attachment. The Hoover Model 2100 introduced in 1962, was an entirely new design for a canister sweeper. It was a self-contained portable vacuum that looked, stored, and carried just like luggage. The portable carried the cleaning tools, electric cord, and the hose inside. But its claim to fame came in 1963 when the Louvre put out a call to display various products from 15 different nations. 300 entries poured in from the United States. Only 40 were selected, including the portal, portable Model 2100. It was chosen for its outstanding and aesthetically pleasing design and extreme functionality. On April 30, 1940, the Hoover Company was ordered to suspend all vacuum production to focus on the manufacture of war products. Hoover manufactured many items, including this parachute and the variable time fuse, on display at the Art Museum. The Hoover Company's experience in making millions of bags for Hoover cleaners was turned to the production of parachutes used for fragmentation bombs. They were 8 feet in diameter and packed into a metal container, as seen below in the display. A metal piece was fastened to the bomb, along with a wire that armed the bomb on its release from the plane. The fragmentation bombs were not created with a time delay, so planes had to fly as low as possible to release them. By attaching parachutes to the bombs, it slowed the descent, allowing the pilots time to safely fly away before detonation. The variable time fuse was probably the most significant development for Hoover. Previous fuses were designed to detonate upon hitting a target, but as targets moved or were further downrange, the possibility of premature detonation was high. Hoover was approached by Johns Hopkins University and the Navy Bureau of Ordnance as early as 1942 to develop a battery for the fuse. What Hoover's engineers created operated like a miniature radio to send and receive signals. When the shell left the gun, the station would send out a continuous radio frequency signal, and as it reached its target, the signal would reflect back to detonate the explosive charge. The Hoover Company's development and production of the variable time fuse was kept under the strictest confidential regulations. No details were divulged to the public until September 1945, well after the war had come to an end. Even at this time, the information that was released omitted all details about its construction. The variable time fuse was not fully declassified by the United States government until 1954, at which time Hoover would receive its fifth Army-Navy E award for excellence in production related to the VT fuse. The Hoover Company would continue to advertise in national outlets and magazines during World War II. These advertisements were not for new floor care products, but instead focused on supporting the war effort by purchasing war bonds, planning victory gardens, conservation, and sharing of current Hoover products. All advertisements were done in conjunction with protocols set by the United States government and the War Advertising Council. However, before and after World War II, Hoover's art department, under the direction of Ellsworth Smith, commissioned works of art such as these two charcoal drawings made by M. Leone Bracker in 1936. 
To learn more about Hoover products, Hoover vacuums, and even Hoover's production during World War II, stop in and see the Hoover Historical Center open March through October on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays for guided tours at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and 3 o'clock p.m. We hope to see you soon so we can share the Hoover legacy with you too. Thanks for watching and joining us for our opening reception for the Camp Museum of Arts current exhibits. Make sure to make your appointment on our website for time ticketing to come and see all this in person. Yes, and our current exhibits that you just saw are open until October 25th, so please come see them in person. Also, you can check out more on our website, cantonart.org. Right here. Yes. <laughs> There's all kinds of great things on there, and we have our virtual tours, CMA from home, all kinds of fun things. Right, Christy? Yes. yes, and speaking of our virtual tour, thank you so much to our superwoman behind the camera tonight, yes, Nikki. Nikki Fetterman. Nikki. Also <laughs> and thank you everyone for watching. <laughs> Bye now.